good to be in the house of God. It's good to be in the house of God. And the title for my message this morning is The Blessing of Generations. It's The Blessing of Generations. And I've been thinking about this as, as, as we're coming into the Christmas season, as we're coming forward into this time. There's so many biblical themes surrounding Christmas. And as, as we're, we're coming into I'm in my, my prayer time, I'm in my worship time, I'm in my conversations with different people of different ages, and we're talking about the miracles the miracles that all happened around the time of Christ's coming. And, and, and I know, I, I think it was Amber I was talking to, or Michelle I was talking to the other day, and I was like, well, why were all these things happening? And we understand that there was joy in the earth and, and that the earth was happy, so to speak. But the heavens were overjoyed. The heavens could not hold back their joy and their praise at the coming of the Lord. And it wasn't just like, wow, look what God did. It's like, look what he's doing. Look what he is accomplishing. Look what he's correcting, what he's fixing, what he's setting things in right order. And as all that's happening, heaven and earth are coming ever closer together in the spirit, and things are released in the spirit. So one of the things that, one of the themes that we see around Christmas is the miracles, right? We see the unexpected uh, pregnancies. We see angelic visitations. We see prophetic dreams. We see, I mean, all these things are, are happening. You know what? And they're alive in the earth today. Because, you know, he is coming again. We celebrate his first coming as we make preparation for the second coming. Amen. So as, 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 we're, as we're looking at that, I mean, look with, a, with a, a excitement. And, and, you know, it's kind of like, well, you know, I don't want the religious stuff to get in the, in the, in the way of my traditions. And I'm like, you know what? But what, what did we read just last week? And so it was, it was the traditions of men that made the word of God of no effect. Jesus said that. Let's move past that. Nothing wrong with the tradition as long as it doesn't become an idol. Amen? Focusing on the things of God. Focusing on the kingdom of God. That you are all citizens of the kingdom of, of God. That we are moved into a place of sonship to the kingdom of God. And I know I said this last night, and I thought it was great. I'm going to have to, have to uh, credit somebody with moving my thoughts along this direction. Calvin Cook is a friend of mine out in California. But the thought came in and said the kingdom of God was the first world government. Now, they we're talking about the one world government. In the beginning, there was one world government. And the kingdom of God will be the last world government. And as we, as, as we understand what does that mean, it means that you are a part of eternal move of God. You're a part of that eternal move of God. And so often we're looking at, at, at Christmas, we begin to go through certain familiar scriptures. And one of, one of the favorites is Isaiah chapter 9. And we're going to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. The promise of God, the messianic promise. It says, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Amen? And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Hallelujah, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. That's the kingdom of God is always about increase. Is the kingdom of God increasing on the inside of you? Is your understanding increasing? Is, is, are you at a place where you're saying, you know, it's growing so big, I don't have time for all this other stuff. But I have time to pursue the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen. He says, upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, in order to establish it with the judgment and justice from that time forward, ever, uh, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. That means it's the passionate love. The passionate love. You know, love is more than words. Love is more than words. Zeal is more than words. More than saying that this is where I am and this is what I have. But it's the zeal of the Lord that will perform it. Amen. So we're moving into, uh, as, we, as we're drawing closer to Christmas, we're moving forward towards Christmas Day, right? That we're, we're at a place where we're looking at many different things happening. And, and I want to spend a little time in Luke 1. I, I spent a little time in Luke 1 last night at the Christmas party, and we're kind of looking at the song of Mary. But I want to talk about Zacharias the father of John. It tells the story, Luke, uh, Luke 1 tells the story of an angelic encounter with Zacharias. A Zacharias was a devoted priest who was performing his duties and, and keeping the incense burning before the altar of the temple. And he and his wife were up there in age. They were old. They were past, they were past their prime, right? They were past what they were supposed, where they thought they would be in life. And they're up in age, childless, because Elizabeth was barren. The Bible says she was barren. She couldn't do it. 
She didn't, she didn't have what it took. But what does it take? It takes a move of God. Amen. They're living in a time that was not, you know, we talk about the joy and the peace and all that, but uh, Jerusalem was not in a place of joy, and they were not in a place of peace. They were in occupied territory. They were occupied by the Roman government. There was public unrest. People were fighting back against the government and factions fighting even within. And they were in a place of, of, of public unrest and also of, of religious oppression. So what were they doing? And, and what, were the, what were the faithful doing? The people who had, had an eye on God, what were they doing? You know what they were doing in the time? They were praying. They, they were in a place, you know, as, as we're walking into it, it says that, that Zacharias was in the temple. He was a priest of a certain division or of a certain order, and it felt his lot. It was his time, and what was his job? He had one job to do at that time, and that was to go into the temple and make sure the incense was still burning. And it says there was a multitude outside the temple. And what were they doing? They weren't flipping through Facebook. They weren't decorating their trees. They were praying. A multitude was praying outside while he's inside and burning the incense. And in verse 11, it says, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Then Zacharias saw him, and he was troubled. He was like, ooh, an angel, and I was at peace. Zacharias said, ooh, an angel. He troubled. It says, fear fell on him. And the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. I thought it was powerful. And, and I, I thought the answer that the angel started with, he said, your prayers have been answered. Oh, Zacharias was like, what prayers? I, I, don't, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old and I'm burning incense. This is my life right now, burning incense and being old. What prayer has been answered? And so it's not a point for today, but, but, but see, it, one of the points that comes up to me in my mind as I'm reading through this is you've got to be mindful of what you pray. You, you, you got to, you know, there's a certain expectation. Maybe he sowed a prayer 30 years earlier or 40 years earlier, 50 years earlier, and he sowed it with such faith, but it was not yet time for it to come to pass. Remember I tell you, the timing of God is not a day on the calendar, is it? It's when all things are ready. And maybe Elizabeth was ready. Maybe Zacharias was ready, but Jerusalem wasn't ready. And God said, we ain't ready. You know, put that on the shelf. But your prayers have been heard. I can honestly do an entire series on the prayers of Zacharias, and not based on any recorded prayers of Zacharias, but of the fulfillment of those prayers that we see throughout the, throughout the, the Bible here. So here he was, an old man, a praying old man, and he was going to sire. He was going to be the father of the greatest prophet up until that time, John the Baptist. And by the way, John's name means the grace of God. He was going to birth an era based on the grace of God. So we'll get some more of the details of his angelic vision in a few minutes. But let me pull out a few of the highlights. Well, number one, his prayers were answered. What was his prayers? Obviously, he sought a son. He sought an heir. He wanted, he wanted his wife to feel valued and useful. He wanted to feel valued and useful himself. He wanted something to pass his legacy onto. But also, not only was he looking for a son, we can see by the angel's response, he was looking for the consolation of Israel. He was looking for his nation to be set free. He was looking for a godly order to come and, and to rule over the Romans and to set the Jewish people to a place of freedom. His prayers had been heard. So what happens? When he comes, he says, the angel comes and he says, you're going to be a dad. And his first response, I'll tell you what it is now, I don't think so. I, I, I don't, he, she's old, I'm old. We're too old to be having children. And I think about that sometimes, and maybe you, you can feel, maybe someone in the room can relate. You know, sometimes I think, man, if, if, if me and Michelle got pregnant, you know, and I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know that'd be, I mean, it'd be exciting, but I'm thinking, that child turns 20, I'll be like, old, old. I can't see myself raising a teenager in 14 or 15 years. I mean, it's like, wow, you start thinking about things like that. And by the way, I know people my age, they have had children. <laughs> and they're raising little ones. And I laugh every time I see their posts. I'm like, whew. 
anyway. So maybe that's why he doubted, you know. But then the angel introduces himself. You know who I am? I'm Gabriel. We call him Gabriel. I am the might of God. I am the angel who stands in his presence. Do like, you know who I am? Tell me no. But because of his unbelief, because of Zacharias' unbelief, he struck dumb for at least nine months. Like, you can't speak no more. Like, you, you done said something dumb. Now you're going to be dumb. And there's a reason why you're no longer permitted to speak. You know, you come this far. But, but, but we have to consider not only the foretelling of the, of the prophecy, but to consider the instruction that he would have on raising a child that's filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of y'all would like to raise some spirit-filled children? Yeah. Only if you're spirit-filled. I'll tell you that right now, because y'all need to be hearing from the same spirit. Amen? I think Jesus and Mary and Joseph, I mean, the, the, the family unit, the generations, we're going to talk about generations. How would it have been for, for Zacharias and for Elizabeth, and now they're raising a child that jumps in the womb? Amazing, right? But we, we, we think about some of these things. We think about some of these assignments that we would have in our lives, and we think, you know, I'm too old, I'm too young. I'm, I'm, I, we don't do that in, in the Northeast. We, you know, but God has other plans. God begins to speak his plan. What is our response to it? And we said, I know we talked a little bit last night because Mary said the same thing. Well, how can this be? I'm a, I've never been with a man. I don't have plans to be with a man other than that man, and he ain't going to be the raising the son of God. <laughs> it's not happening that way. But it wasn't a question of, like, this is impossible. I think her question is, how is this possible? I need more information. And she got more information than her response was, be it unto me according to your word. As you have said, so it shall be. And, and so you watch how faith now moves. And watch how faith can produce. And I think about the timing of the events, because by the time we got here, you know, Mary's already had some, some conversations. I mean, God says, I have to bring this thing to pass. We already said it, this is what's going to happen. And so now it's going to come to pass. Stop Zacharias from stopping it. Stop, stop the mouth of this priest turning into a prophet and the prophet cannot speak against the things of God. How many of y'all remember Balaam? Balaam's like, oh, I, I can speak, God, give me some money, I'll speak it, it will come to pass. And he opens his mouth and he cannot curse Israel. Only the blessings come out. And all the people that hire me, what are you doing? He's like, I don't know. My mouth, this is what happens. <laughs> you know? I, spoke my, I opened my mouth to speak against them, but only the blessings would come out. They're like, give us our money back. You know? He said, I'll, let me try again. Let me try again. He said, but you cannot curse that which God has blessed. Amen? But that means that you're not under a curse. That means you might be affected by one, but you are not under it. Right? It's time for you to walk in a place of freedom. Hallelujah. That whatever curse you think you are under, it's time for you to get out from under it and run out ahead and get into the glory of God and be set free. Amen. Do you want to be a blessing to the generations? Do you want to see the generations, the old and the young, blessed? A part of Christ's kingdom and a part of a good work is blessed generations. Amen. And we want to see that. And I want to be a part of it. I had a conversation with the Lord. And I said, I want to be a part of the blessing of all generations. I said, Lord, open my eyes, my understanding, so I could actually stand in a better place. And God began to speak to me about that. I think of all the years of ministry. I have done, I did little kids. I did nursery. I did youth. I did young adults. I, I did the general population. I did time with the seniors. One of the first things that I did when I came into the ministry was on Wednesday morning, I would meet with all the seniors in the church, and we would pray together. And they would pray for me. He's so cute. Look at him. He's so cute. He's trying so hard. <laughs> but they were a blessing in my life. God, so I'll tell you what. You know, there's times, and I know as, as a young minister, I'd be out cleaning the church and doing different things, and, and I would pick up an old person's Bible, and I would sit down and look at all the notes that they had, and I would like, ooh, and they were like, can I have my Bible back? I said, can I keep it for a week? There's some good sermons in here. I need this. I need this. This is good. So I'm passing things generation to generation. Keep your old Bibles and let the next generation have them. Even if you got stuff wrong in there, don't worry about it. They'll figure it out. But you know what they'll see? They'll see the faithfulness of somebody who has followed God. They might see your, your growth as you went from this was my Bible A to my Bible C to my Bible E, you know? 
as, as you're walking through, that there's something that can be passed down generation to generation. But if you want to be more effective, there's some questions that you can ask yourself. I'm going to ask these questions today. Number one, are you willing to lay aside the prosperity of this world to receive greater things from God? Are you willing to lay aside the prosperity of this world to receive greater things from God? Some of you all are parents, you know and you understand, you had to make some sacrifices in your life so you could raise up godly children. And a lot of people in, in our generations don't know that. They thought the best thing they could do was to provide some money and provide some extras, but, but are we spending and investing time in the formation of character? Are, are we showing them how to be loving husbands and wives? Are we showing them how to be effective members of society? Are we able to resolve things? Are we, are we able to, to impart things into that next generation? I think that's important. Amen. I, said, I, I originally said, are you willing to lay down your vision? for this world to receive better things from God. Last week we talked about how passion brings forth transformation. Are you willing to be transformed and allow somebody to witness your transformation? That, that, it's a sacrifice. I mean, you know it's a sacrifice sometimes. I've, I've had all these things that I was going to do, but you know what? I don't want to do it because then I can see how it's impacting the people around me. Willing to make the sacrifice. When I know... <clears throat> that what I want is contrary to what's best? Am I seeking that transformation? Am I seeking the grace to complete my God-given assignment? The grace to fulfill my purpose? Am I, am I in that place where I'm willing to do that? You know, Lord, I'll tell you there's times when, when I know, I said, I know what my heart's desire is. I know what I'm craving. I know what I'm looking for. I know what I have geared my life around, but I realize now that it's different from what God's plan is for perfection, for completeness, for peace. And when I see that, my prayer is, Lord, help me desire the better things. Change my, my desires so that my desires are now lined up with your plan. And when we, when we can grasp that, and God hears that prayer, and he goes, I'll do the work of transformation. Part of the reason why Zacharias was struck dumb was because he needed to make a transformation from priest into prophet. He had to, he had to make a transformation from, from a Zachariah generation to a John generation. That there's something had to move and had to shift and had to change for him to be able to raise up a family the way God wanted him to. Galatians 2.20, it struck me so hard when I was reading it the other day. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. Just leave that up there for a minute. Because I, I want us to, to, to look and, and we, we can say these things. See, this is the Apostle Paul writing it. And this is where he says, I've been persecuted. I've been pressed down. I've been crushed. And he says, so now because of all of that, I am dead to my flesh, but I am alive in the spirit. And that is a word that God is speaking to his church today. He's saying, die in your flesh. Live by the spirit because there's more life in my spirit than there is in your flesh. And that life will be eternal while your flesh is dying. Your, your spirit is growing and there's a new place for life. What does it mean? I'm at a place where I'm saying that now I am fueled by a different source. I'm, I'm not fueled by, by, by my, my ambition. I'm not fueled by, by somebody else's idea of what I should be. But now I'm in line with what God wanted me to be, what God wants me to be. And all the years that I wasted going after all these other things, it doesn't matter. Let it die. Because my God restores things. My God has redeemed the time. Showing us how to get some things accomplished. Amen. I, I'm now fueled by a different source. I have a different motivation. I have a different motivator and, and a different empower than what I once had. And that will impact generations, those ahead and those behind. Amen. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, today's a good day to get saved. Amen. It's a good day to get filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a good, this is what Jesus talks about, being born again. You're not just born again just by spirit, but you're also being born again in the spirit of your mind. You're thinking differently than what you ever have before. And we've been praying for this. God, open my eyes. Give us spiritual eyes and ears so we can see the things of the Spirit. So I'm not looking at what a man looks at, but I'm looking how God looks. I'm seeing, I'm seeing a, a reality and a truth that transcends what I see with my natural eyes. This gives us fresh meaning to Romans 12.1, where the apostle says we should present our bodies as living sacrifices, 
Now look, look at 12, Romans 12.1. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, when I read this a lot, and I know I preach this a lot, and I'm not backing off of what I'm preaching, that when it talks about your body, it means your whole being. But when we can read this and, and say, you know what? If a, a sacrifice is not living. A sacrifice is a dead thing. But he says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Where did this death get life? From the Spirit. It's a living, dead thing. It honors Christ and everything that it does. That's what we're being transformed into. That's what we're looking forward to. And that's what we can prove. It's a transformation of the mind which proves what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. If we can get that into our spirit, we can live a different life, a new life. Changed, transformed, and made new. We begin to understand the dying of the flesh and, and, and realize that when we're dead in the flesh, that we are alive in the spirit. As the Apostle Paul talked about this in repeated ways and repeated places. And it's very powerful. 2 Corinthians 4.10, he talks about always caring about the body, uh, in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in my body. Or in other words, yes, he died on the cross and he showed us how to die in the flesh and to live in the spirit. And, and that's where he comes. And he says in verse 11, For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also be made manifest in our mortal flesh. It means that, um, it means that there is a supernatural empowerment of the Spirit that where my body cannot function, my body can't get the job done, the Spirit says, yes, you will, and picks you up and gets you going. I'll tell you what, there's times I'm too tired. I, I, I don't have the energy and the strength to go on. I said, but if I pray in the Spirit, I might still be too tired, but I'm going to get there. I'm going to get the job done. I, I, I can't function because my body is rejecting the things that, uh, that I need to get done. But if I live in the Spirit, the Spirit will give my body everything it needs to continue to the next day. You we're looking for the, the secrets. We're, we're looking for the principles that'll get us to a place of healing. And, and what I'm, I'm seeing in the Spirit, what I'm seeing in the Word of God is that we don't have to be healed to be made whole. Our bodies can still be suffering, but it doesn't know it's suffering because the animation of the Spirit is bringing us into a deeper place. Am I making sense? If I'm not, don't worry about it. It'll come, Amen. So as we're crying out for our next generation to be born or to be mature or to come into the kingdom of God, what are you willing to sacrifice to see it? Are you willing to sacrifice a few hours of sleep? Are you willing to sacrifice a, a, an event? Are you willing to, to sacrifice some of the things that, that the world says, this is what you have to do? But what we do is when we sacrifice that, we're giving it up to God. And we're saying, Lord, I know this is more of what your desire is. I know they might get angry for a minute. I know they might resent. I know people will look at me and they'll think different things about me and think I'm a religious nut. But let them think what they want because their opinions will pass away. God's truth stands. And his blessings will flow from generation to generation. Amen. Some of us will be required, some of us in this room will be required to give up more than others for our next generation's sake. We'll be able to live in the life of Jesus. But, and we want that next generation to be able to live by the life of Jesus. And that's what the Apostle Paul was saying. He says, we, 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 are, we are, 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 are tortured all day long, but you will have life. There's a particular calling, and there are people who are called to make a certain sacrifice, and everybody else will see the benefit. And they might look at you as being weak. They might look at you as being small. They might look at you as being imperfect, but it doesn't really matter as long as they are able to move forward in their calling. God will resolve it all. That's what Paul was talking to Timothy. You see, you're watching everybody else prosper in their wickedness, but you know my ways. You see, you know my doctrines. You've heard my teachings. You've seen my sufferings. And all of that is, is an element to Christ's likeness. Powerful, powerful, and we can bring this in. Amen. When culture comes against the kingdom, are you willing to come against culture in a meaningful way? When the culture is coming against the things of the kingdom of God, are you willing to stand up? Not just railing against it or complaining against it, but are you really ready to demonstrate a better way? Living over our means or living in a lifestyle that prevents us from coming to church and fellowshipping with other believers or even spending time in the true presence of God. 
there's some things as I'm praying over this that, that keep coming to mind. I'm like, you know what? There's so much of the Christian world that is falling apart. Past generations allowed some things to take place that have now taken the, the priority of God outside of our culture. And it's time for us to go and to bring it back. I'm not shaming that generation. I'm saying that it's time to turn some things around. They were told that we have to acquiesce. They were told that we have to be more less stringent, that, that we have to, 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 to give way to some of these other things. And what did we end up doing? We gave up the Sabbath. What did we, what did we end up doing? We stopped, we stopped talking about truth and righteousness. Righteousness and truth just became bywords, but we're not demonstrating it anymore because somebody's feelings are going to get hurt. But what happens when we begin to speak the truth? Oh, there's a rumbling. There's going to be earthquakes because the violent will take it by force. But, Dad, I hate you because this is what you, you said, you, and, and you're making me a laughing stock and, and all these things. That that's okay because when they all fall down, you'll still be standing. A thousand may fall at my, and 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come near you. You'll stand strong in the day and in the hour. You'll be like, you know what? I don't even have a hunger or an appetite for the things those people are doing. Well, what are you doing home early? Oh, they was getting into it. I'm not getting in that. Why? Because it's on the inside. Because the Holy Spirit tells on you. Every time you're about to do something wrong, mom shows up. <laughs> mom had a spirit of prophecy. And she said, I know you're going down to the Cumberland Times. I know JoJo's going to be there. We don't like him. Breaking in and being invasive because God said so. Going back to Zacharias, the father of John, God had a purpose for this diligent priest and his godly wife to birth a child that would be filled with the Holy Spirit and raised up with God's vision. They had a purpose that they would raise up with God's vision. And so he's moving, Zachari moving from a Zacharias generation to a generation of John. You know, the name Zacharias, they wanted to name John Zacharias. That means God remembered. God, you know, and you know, there's times where God remembered, God remembered. And it's like, that's good, that's good, that's good. But it gets to a certain place where it's like, yeah, we know, God remembered. We know, God remembered. But now we're talking about the next generation, the grace of God. The, oh my, whew, the empowerment of God, the mercy of God that leads to the empowerment of God. You will not name him Zacharias. You will not name him after yourself. You will name him by the word given by God. And he will be the one that brings the mercy and the grace of God, preparing the way for the Messiah to come. And he will go out in the wilderness, half-dressed, eating bugs and flowers and honey, and shouting at people and bringing conviction. But that was his calling. That, no, no, dignified people don't act like that, John. No. They're like, John, get out there and do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Go out there and accomplish the thing that you're, that you're out there to accomplish. Start baptizing people and looking for the Christ because he is coming. Amen. Zacharias, from a watchful, enduring hope, with, with the faith and the passion to command the gates of heaven to be open and make forward the coming of the Lord, the blessing of all generations. The next few verses... We see like verses 59 through 66. I'm not going to read it to you. But it says, you know, the child, John, is born. And it comes to eight days after his birth. That's the time of the circumcision. And at the time of the circumcision, that's when they give the child the name. And everybody's standing there. Zachariah still can't talk. He's, hey, Zach, how you doing? I got nothing to say. You know, can you imagine that this is what's happening? And we're going to bring your son. And everybody said, hey, little Zacharias. His name's going to be Zacharias. And Elizabeth said, no, his name's going to be John. And I said, John, who's John? Who that? <laughs> There's no John in your family. Who's John? Never heard of a John before. And he said, well, and Zacharias said, bring me a tablet. Bring, bring, me, some, bring me some paper. And he says, his name's going to be John. And all of a sudden, he could speak again. And the people were amazed. This man, he's talked for so long. And, and the first thing that comes out of his mouth, he wrote, his name will be John. The next thing that came out of his mouth is what? Praise for God. I mean, wouldn't you, if you were shut up for nine months and your mouth was quiet and you couldn't talk to nobody, you couldn't shout? And, and, and what's he doing? He says, oh, praise God, hallelujah, I'm back. And then he says, his name will be John. 
He brings out the praises of God, hallelujah, and he gets ready and he begins to prophesy next and he begins to prophesy what the will of God is. And the next thing after that, he begins to prophesy a blessing over his son and to bring forward the next generation, to bring forward the, the John the Baptist, the one who would make way for the coming of Christ. Amen. So I'll come back again. The question is, what are you willing to sacrifice to get the better things from God? to bring something better for God into the earth. You know, I say this a lot, and I, and I truly mean it. A lot of things that we pray for, we pray over our generations. We pray for, for things to happen. It may not happen on our time, but it will come to pass. If it's, if, if, it's, if it's God's will, you're praying the will of God, you're praying by faith, it will come. It'll come, it'll come, it'll come. It may not happen in your lifetime. I'm like, I'm okay with that. But if the, the, the will of God is accomplished and my prayers can be a part, praise God, amen. amen. Second, second question is this, are you prepared to tell God's story? Are you prepared to tell the story of God? Are you, are you prepared to tell the story of faith, the truth? Are you, are you prepared to, to tell the truth in the midst of everything else that's going on around? I don't think Zacharias was ready. I don't think he was prepared to tell the story. Perhaps he was prepared to tell the story of disappointment. Well, you know, I, I prayed for a child and the child didn't come. Elizabeth is old now. She was cute when she was young, but boy, she's a sturdy woman, amen. But... She's, she's feeble now, and, you know, and, and things are, I mean, you know, God blessed that one and that one, but he never blessed that. Could you imagine what was going to come out of his mouth? If we do have a, a child probably come out stupid, you know, I mean, just, you know, start thinking about things like that. What was he, what was he thinking? What was going through his head? Why did, the, why, did the, why, why did the angel have to shut his mouth? And whatever happened with him and Elizabeth, they were now up in years, and here comes the angel of the Lord. God heard your prayers. And essentially... He told the angel, God's late. Here comes your blessing, too late. Can you imagine that? Zacharias had an attitude. He needed a course correction, amen. Perhaps Zacharias needed some time to think about it. Perhaps he needed some time to marinate in his own foolishness and his response to an encounter with God's messenger. And that's, I mean, just think about it. Sometimes when God tells you stuff, you're like, nah. Now, you talk yourself right out of your blessing. Goes around the mountain again until it comes. Or it goes off to somebody else. Or it gets passed down to another generation. We need to be mindful of the things of God. God answers your prayer and say, thank you. Don't say, can't be you. Can't be God. After he expresses his doubts, moving back a little bit to Luke 1.19, after he says, my wife is old, the angel answered him and said to him, I am Gabriel. He who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and to bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and you'll not be able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. What does that mean? God's timing. Not to live. It could have happened. Today could have been the day, but you weren't ready. Now it will be fulfilled in the right time. And I think that the tying up of Zacharias' tongue was merciful. I think the tying up of his tongue was purposeful. God had a purpose in it. If he had been permitted to speak, what foolishness would have followed? <laughs> have you ever had Zacharias moments before? Times that maybe you wish God had struck you dumb, tied up your lips, kept things from coming out that shouldn't have come out. Are there some Zacharias's in your life that you wish God had kept them quiet? <laughs> God had kept your mouth shut in a particular moment. Back up a little bit more to verse 13. This is what the angel had said before he shut him down. He said, do not be afraid, Zacharias. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you'll call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he'll be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will, turn, uh, he will turn many of the children of Israel back to the Lord their God. And he will also go before him in spirit and in the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Woo! Imagine that spoken over your child. And his response, I don't see it happening. <laughs> you were, I don't know where you got it from, but... You know, he's a false angel. I mean, what are you, you going to say? 
And so we grab context on this, but the angel of the Lord is speaking prosperity over him and over his wife and, and over his offspring. And you say, no, nah, prove it. Prove, prove, prove it to me. And sometimes that's what we get. We get the word of God. It comes, you're like, okay, well, if God, if this is really you, I need a sign. Jesus said it's a wicked and adulterous generation that seeks a sign. I seek the truth. I seek the word of God. I seek his own confirmations. Amen? But God was transitioning Zacharias from being a priest to a prophet. Zacharias wasn't ready. God needed him ready. God needed him ready. Amen. Some of the prophetic utterances are, are given not only to predict the move of God, but to usher in his move. A lot of times when we think, we think, the, we think a, a spirit of prophecy, we think that a prophetic move of God is all about fortune telling and telling you the things that are in your future. The thing is that sometimes that God has raised up prophets that walk with a particular authority. He sets them into a region to bring things to pass, and he gives them the word. And when they speak the word, that word is released, and things come to pass. And that's what Zacharias was being brought up into. And that's why the angel said, you cannot speak against the things of God. Shut your mouth. It's not going to come to pass. We need to step up into the place of our callings. Amen. The question is, are you prepared to bless the generations with God's story? Are you prepared to bless the generations with the gospel? Like, how does it impact them? How did it impact your life? How is it impacting the world around you? Not making it about you, but always keeping it about him. Always keeping it about the things of God, the future, the things that are yet to come. My God, I think about that sometimes. I'm like, you know, I, I, I need a stronger word. I need a stronger testimony at times, but I really don't because I'm a living sacrifice. I really don't because I'm a living testimony. And my testimony bears power and it bears strength when it comes from the heart and it's coming not from my heart, but from his heart from the heart of God, until I attain, until I am perfected, it needs to come from the heart of God. I declare and I decree, I declare and decree nothing if I've not heard it from God. Are you prepared? After at least nine months, Zacharias was finally ready. It's written that his child shall be named John, the grace of God, or graced by God. His tongue is loosed, and the next thing that comes out of his mouth, yeah, praise for God comes God's intentions, the messianic prophecy, and a prophecy over the child John, the role that he would play in the narrative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to verse 76, Luke 1, 76. And this is the word that Zacharias is speaking, the word of prophecy that comes from him. He says over uh, his son, and you child will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercies of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited, to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Yeah. Now, mind you, he's talking over an eight-day-old child. What's he doing? He's opening the gates. He's training them up in the way. He's beginning something powerful, something y'all have been talking to. And I'm talking about over your children and over your spouse. And like, they're, 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 they got this going on. They got that going on. They're wild. They're crazy. Pray over them while they sleep. Pray over them when, when they ain't crazy. But pray over, pray over their eyes. Pray over their ears. Pray over their mind. Pray over their future. But you grab hold of that because you are the prophet in their life. You are the one that is currently setting the direction. You are the one that is seeking God for them. What are you willing to give up for your next generation? Don't speak bad things over your children. Don't let other people speak bad things over your children. If they speak bad over you, pray good over them. Begin to usher in what God's going to bring into the next generation. My kid's not a failure. My kid is a great success. He's not going to grow up to be nothing. He's going to grow up to be something more than something. Amen. He's right. He's going to stand on my shoulders. He's going to get the 64 where I was just at 30. He's going to that higher place or she's going to the higher place. They're going to carry it further down the, the road. They're going to say, hey, isn't that Pastor Dave's daughter? Yes, it is. And what is she doing? She's breaking down the kingdoms and, and she's moving forward in the gospel. Hallelujah. She, she's, she's casting down the sinners. They're all like, hey, you cute, honey. What is your name? My name is in the name name of Jesus Christ. You'll bring that over here. You need to get saved. Hallelujah. No, no, saved not enough. You be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized. Then go talk to my father. Ooh, don't start with me. Amber's like, I'll never get a date. <laughs> You're ruining my social life. <laughs> Hallelujah. So after he speaks this word, oh, look, 
Verse 80, what happened after he speaks this? He says, so the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts until the day of his manifestation to Israel. In other words, it came to pass. It came to pass. And the things that we pray over our children, things we pray over our elders, things we're praying over our peers, if it's godly, make a declaration, it's coming to pass. But you, you prayed it and nothing happened. I said, well, I prayed it and you didn't happen. But it's coming to pass. It's coming to, it, it, will, it will come to pass. Speak those words of faith. I said, they were here on Wednesday night and we're praying. And I'm saying, you know what? If somebody's praying and they're praying good and they're in it and they get that key word that comes up, repeat the key word and shout it out. Begin to break down the barriers of unbelief in your life and in the lives of the people around you. There's times so that people say things or, or, or post things or whatever, they write things, and I'm like, Psh, whatever. And then somebody with authority says, amen, that was good. I'm like, let me look at that again. Why? Because godly authority has an influence. I don't know when somebody's walking in godly authority that some things are worth a second, third look. And when they said it's foolishness, I could look and say, let me find the folly in what I just saw and what I just heard. That's what it means to walk together. And let the generation speak one to the next, to the next. Amen. I'll put this up this morning, but, you know, the, the same question. I'm prepared to tell God's story, but in Psalm 78, verses 2 through 4, it's spoken like this. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which, have, uh, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children. You get a revelation, tell your child. You get blessed, tell your child, I will not hide it from my children. Telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. We need a testimony in our lives and we need to, and we need to pass that down to the next generation. Generation to generation to generation. If I have been blessed, you'll be double blessed. I'll put my hand upon your head and I'll speak blessings into the next generation. That's how we saw the fathers of old doing it. The fathers said, don't, don't just lay hands on them to discipline them. Lay hands on them, and please discipline them, but <laughs> lay hands and speak a blessing over them. Even to a place where they go, you're failed, and I was miserable in this area, but I will not pass that down to the next generation. That's where you will succeed. There's enough lies about God and the blessings of so-called great men, ancestors, forefathers, and foreign gods. We have all of this out here. We don't need to play into that. We need to play into the realities. You know, something amazing I, that, that we had seen like over the years, you know, it's like, okay, well, let's talk about godly people. Let's talk about godly men. Nobody can name anyone, but you know all the Avengers. You know all the Power Rangers. You know, I mean, you know the Powerpuff Girls, you know the Teletubbies, but you don't know anything about the things of the kingdom of God. That there's a reality that we need to step up into and they're going to tell these truths. There's, there's modern, you don't just have to go to the Bible. There's, there's men and women of God now that are rising and doing incredible things. We need, to, we need to hold fast to those stories and bring them forward and, and show them there's heroes for today. You know, back when I was in college, I did a sociology study. And what I had to do back in those days, we didn't have internet or anything. You actually had to do the work. And when I, <laughs> sorry. And so, so we, we, we got on a train and we went to Boston. We took a bus and we went, and we went to a school and, and, and down in, in the inner city. And we started to interview kids and, and ask them all these questions. They're middle schoolers. And, you know, they, you, you think they're all like, oh, let's just run around and act foolish. But, and, and that's what they did. But they weren't like that all the way through. We started to interview them and talk to them about things they wanted to do with their life. And, and you know, the kids were they're funny. You know, the kids were all, you know, they weren't like, I want to be a superhero. They weren't saying things like, you know what they're saying? They're saying things like, I'd like to be a bus driver. I remember that one very specifically. I'd, I'd like to be a bus driver. I'd, I'd like to work as a chef in the kitchen. I would like, you're like, you're, like, you're, not, you're not like just want to do NBA and, F, and, and NFL and stuff. That's not, they're like, no, no, I think, I, I think this would be more, more um, reasonable, and this is where I think I'd be happy in life. And I'm like, what is wrong with these kids? <laughs> but it just hit me while I was talking to them. I said, do you know anybody that's a bus driver? Do you know anybody that does that? I'm like, yeah, my uncle Todd, he, 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 he works. He, I'm, 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 and, 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 and this got me an A on the assignment. We began to show how family life influenced what they desired to be when they got older. How the people, like real people. There's something breaks my heart sometimes when, when you hear people today and it's like, well, who is the greatest influence in your life? And they start talking about fictional characters or, 
you know, an actor, somebody they've never met. I'm like, are we finding greater motivation from two-dimensional people? They're just two-dimensional. They're, they're a couple of words and, 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 and a, a picture. But what about real-life people that you interact with on a regular basis? Those are not what our, our children aspire to be. Something's out of order. Amen? Amen? Young people need, young people and old people need to hear true stories about how God has blessed us and intervened in our lives. Young people need to hear the true cost and rewards of discipleship. I'm going to say that again. Young people need to hear the cost and rewards of discipleship. And they need to see the people they know and admire uh, paying the price and, and walking in the blessings of God. A lot of reasons why a lot of people don't worship today is because they never saw anybody worship when they were young. They, they didn't see the value of it. They didn't see the authenticity of it. And, they, and, and our younger people need to see that. You know what? Our older people need to see that. I mean, y'all think some old people need some encouragement. Our older generation needs some encouragement. They need to see that the things that they're sowing, that there is a, a harvest in it. Amen? To so go after these types of things. They need to hear stories. They need to know about a Savior that came into this world as an infant, was incarnate, and lived a most admirable life and died a most gruesome and sacrificial death so that we would all have eternal life with him in heaven and in time, the new earth. Don't stop at pictures of people transforming into angels and flying into heavens and all of that. That stuff's not true. It's fiction. It's fiction that's derived from mythologies. It's not Christianity. It's not the Bible. The Bible tells us that, yes, to be absent with the, from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we know that. We understand there's a graduation. However, the Lord is coming back. And when he comes back, there's going to be a trumpet blast. There's going to be a shout, the voice of an archangel. And those who have died in Christ will rise. And those who are still alive will meet him in the air. And then we all come back to earth together, a new earth. There's a reality that we, we think it ends at a certain point, but it's not ending there. We need to start teaching that there's that something that is more. And Jesus is not just far away, like floating around like an angel. and just. I mean, no, he's seated in the high places. He is seated on a throne in his kingdom. He is seated upon that throne. We need to stop, stop looking at an old, outdated vision and version of Jesus and look to who he truly is. Not only who, who he truly is, who we are becoming. He says, for when he, was re when he is revealed, we shall be like him. That when he is revealed, we shall be like him. That's what we are becoming. He's coming back, not from a beat up, jacked up bride. He's coming back for a bride without spot or blemish. That we will be ready at the time of his return. Amen? Are you prepared to tell his story? Number three, are you prepared to give your gifts to the generations? That's powerful. Are you prepared to give your gifts to the generations? We should be seeking after the gifts of God and using them freely to bless the generations. A lot of time we talk about the elder uh, blessing the younger, but the, it's the will of God that we care for one another in unity. We, the gifts of God. How many of y'all got spiritual gifts? Do you have the gifts of God? Is there one person in here you got the gifts of God? Amen. Talk to me. Amen. Amen. Romans 12, 6, then having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let's use them. You got a gift. Use it. Amen. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. That doesn't mean every prophet or anybody who prophesies is going to be prophesying the same. We're going to go according to the gift of God on the inside, according to the grace that's been given to us in the moment that's there. I'm not saying manufacture it. I'm saying go get it. Use it. Amen. If it's a ministry or work, then use it in ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, and he who leads with diligence, he who sows with mercy and with cheerfulness, and, and let love be without hypocrisy. Hate what's evil, cling to what is good. So, so there's, in other words, just get off the bench. If you don't have it, go get it. If you don't understand it, learn. But don't be satisfied with stagnancy. I, I'm going to lay hold of that for which he laid hold of me. I press. I press. It's part of my daily prayers. There's always a point where I'm like, I press, I press. What am I doing? What am I pressing for? I'm pressing into the power and the presence of God because I can't do this on my own. I need his strength and his grace and his mercy. Amen. Joel 2.28. We, we talked about this a few weeks ago with the, the, the restoration of time. 
the restoration of all things after going through a hard and a difficult season. I told you Jerusalem was in a desperate place, a, a dangerous place, and, and it only got worse and worse and worse, but until the time of Christ come again, and things will get better and better and better. Hallelujah. But in Joel 2.20, it says that after that, it shall come to pass after the dry season and after the restoration. He says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Ah, hallelujah. Amen. They'll prophesy. Amen. Our sons and our daughters will prophesy. Amen. You shall prophesy. You shall prophesy. You shall prophesy. Even little Ben, hey, I got a word from God. Hallelujah will prophesy, and the Spirit of God's going to come, and your old men will dream dreams. I will have dreams. Hallelujah. Your younger, you'll have vision. I like that. And yeah, old men dreams. And your young men, I'm still a young man, have visions. Hallelujah. And on your manservants and your maidservants, I'll pour out my Spirit in those days. And, and there's, there's something that is so significant and powerful about that if we have the faith to bring it to pass in this generation. That the old men are having dreams, and what are they doing? They're telling their dreams to the younger generation. I have a dream for you. I, I, have, a, I have a dream for this nation. I have a dream for this community. I have a dream for this family. These are the things that I've seen and I perceive. And it's not like I'm falling asleep and God just gives me a dream. No, I'm dreaming forward. My mind is set upon it. My heart is set upon it. And the younger one's having a vision. I got your dream and now I'm turning it into a vision. What does that mean? That means I'm going to show you how to get it done. This was dad's dream. This is how we're going to make it happen. And the younger one's prophesying. I see it. It's coming to pass. It's coming to pass. I shall receive it. And then they get a little older. Now they got vision. And the ones that had a vision now is having dreams. And it's going generation to generation to generation. I'm telling you, you old people, hallelujah, the young ones need your dreams. They need your visions. The young ones and, and the, us older ones, we need to hear their prophecies. We need to see the things that they are seeing. We need to know that there is a future and a hope, hallelujah, that, that, that after these things, there is a hope and a future. And it's been designed by God. He's ordering the steps of the righteous. Man devises a plan, but God orders his steps. Yeah. Woo, hallelujah. Man, if we, if we get to, I was talking about some of this last night, but let's do it. Let's get it. I'm telling you, older generation, begin to pass something on. As we get ready for Christmas, this Christmas, pass on a dream. Give them the gift of a dream. Show them what you see in them. Show them what you see in the years and the generations. And maybe they're too young to get it, but don't worry. Someday they'll get older. And they'll get it. And they'll be able to receive it. They'll, they'll get it at that time. My God, if we could see this. Uh, sometimes I, I hear, we see it on, on, on movies and stuff like that. So I recorded a video for my grandchild, even though the grandchild's not been, because I may not be here when they come. That kind of thing. And it's like, you know, why don't we do that? I'm not saying do a video. I'm saying write it out. I'm saying inscribe it upon something. I'm saying pass that thing, generation to generation. They're heirlooms. They get passed down generation to generation. But do they have meaning? Yes, Grandma really loved having her tea in that. That's cute. Let's go further. Let's go further. This is what I'm passing to that next generation. And pray over it and believe the power of God will rest upon it. Believe that there's, there's moments that will wake up. What are some of the things you have from childhood that were passed down from a parent, from a grandparent, from a great-grandparent that have meaning to you? Don't throw it away. Talk about it. Find, find, an, find something that's in that, that that tells the story of God. Young people, begin to encourage your older generation. Don't be like, they don't understand nothing. They don't know nothing. They've been through some stuff. They'll be like, yeah, but they don't have an Instagram. Like, she's a gram. She's on Instagram. That's, that's a long-running gram right there. There's, there's a reality. You know what? Us older people, we like to be loved and respected and honored. Amen? Anybody else? Amen. Amen. And, so, so, and, and when there's dishonor and disrespect, it breaks the heart. And it dishonors God. God will visit that dishonor and disrespect. God will visit that and judge it. We don't want to do that. We want to be in the right place with God. He said, honor your mother and your father and you shall have long life. Dishonor them, they'll cut it short. <laughs> Teach them, bring them up in the way. You know, it's the gifts that will bring you before great men. Honor begets so many things. Do a study on honor. As a matter of fact, don't do a study on honor because Nick's going to preach on it in a few weeks. He's going to bring the noise. Amen. But as we're moving forward in these things, getting ready for our, 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 our celebrations, 
Watch this. I'm talking about just living by the Spirit, living by the Spirit of God. Everything I'm talking about, it sounds like it's impossible. Nothing is impossible in Christ Jesus. Nothing is impossible with the Spirit of God operating in you. Look at this Isaiah 43 and watch the blessings of God here. He says, but now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you and have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. And when you walk through fire, you will not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. That is the blessings of walking in the power and the presence and in the spirit of the Lord. So in other words, we shouldn't cast it off lightly. If there's going to be a move of God, I'll tell you, God, if you're moving, I want to be in the move. I had a dream years ago, years ago. And I saw, I saw in my old church, I saw a river flowing past the church. And I saw all the people I know, and they're in there, man. They're in tubes and, and little and kayaks and stuff. And they're like, hey. And I'm like, I want to go in the river. I said, I want to dive into that river because I know that river was the spirit of God carrying them to the place of their destination. God's calling us to his river. Amen. It's the, this is the promise and the reward of people who search for the deeper riches of the kingdom of God. And when we neglect the generations, we rob them of the opportunities to connect with God. You hear me? When we neglect the generations, we rob them of the opportunities to connect with God. When we dishonor our elders, we offend them. And, and, and that, that, that keeps them from being able to have a true experience with God. When we do not talk to the younger generations and tell them what God has for them and usher them in and bring them in and get them used to the power and the presence of God, they can have deeper experiences. Deeper experiences. What are the things that have kept you out? from the power and the presence of God. I could go down a list, but I'll offend a lot of people. What are the results? Rejection and abandonment, low self-esteem, damaging mindsets, poverty and lack, denial and delay. That, that is the result of not having godly interactions, not having experiences in the power and the presence of God. Jesus says, I've come that they would have life and that they would have it more abundantly. The Apostle Paul says, how then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? The generations are important to God. And there are great rewards for those who cry out for and care for them, minister to the generations, giving and receiving, preaching, teaching, encouraging, and receiving. These are all important parts of ministering generation to generation. And God's calling on you today, calling on every one of us to be willing, calling on every one of us to sacrifice for another generation, every one of us to not only be able, but to be willing to tell God's story. Now, now's the time. Now's the time. We have an opportunity in, in the holidays here. We're going to be spending time with our families around Christmas. Our extended family, we have time to sit at the table and tell the story, not just the nativity story, and that's good, but to tell the story of a living God. We see Jesus around Christmas, and we always think of, of, of the baby in the cradle. And it's like, he's not a baby anymore. The story was not about a baby. The story was about the Spirit of God taking human form so he could live a sinless life and die so that we could be with him forever. When we understand that Jesus Christ was crucified before time even began, that this was already the plan, and time had come this far, but said, I, I can't complete that call until I have a body to die in. And that's the fulfillment of the promise. It was like, that's horrible. What a horrible thing to say at Christmas, Pastor Dave. Now, you don't understand. Without that, we don't have life. Without that, we have no hope, no future. Without that sacrifice that was made, and that sacrifice was not possible, had Christmas not come. Let's pray. Hallelujah. 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 
God be glorified. God be glorified. God be glorified.